Ethan could just go on. But Ned was really the guy that started a lot of this. And uh, you know, I could talk about Harvard, and I could talk about his books and all the things that he's written. Very close feeling about the positivity that every human being with ADHD should convey and live on a daily basis and look for the gifts that are there. And so Ned gave many of us that opportunity through his words, and words do create worlds, and Ned has created some beautiful worlds for us. And in those worlds, we all transformed, uh, many of us, and that's what that is about. But Ned gave us the platform through his words, through his presentations, through being on network TV, and it's always been the positive voice of transformation. Now, if you take the word transformation, you break it down into to its roots, Latin or Greek, I forgot which one, but trans means to go beyond. Form means your physicality, and Asian is experience. So if you put them together, transformation is going on the experience of your own form, going beyond that external bullshit of performance and standards and how you should be, and going inside to who you are, the authenticity, the authentic you. And that is about that. He's really about authenticity. But now I think he's moved to a new place, this spiritual place of transcendence, where, yes, I'm about individual personal transformation. I'm about wanting every human being. But now I think Ned's on a bigger plane, a bigger platform, a bigger stage, where he is through connection and wanting us to go connect ourselves to a bigger world, a bigger universe with meaning. You know, last night he said, find your dream, find your purpose, find your passion. And really, since I've known Ned, that's what he's, all, he's always been about. He's taken us from that individual stage of doing it on our own, and now he's taken us to the global stage, representing all of us and saying, go out and be yourself, and don't go out and impact every person that you come in contact to make a better world. That's who Ned Hollowell is. So with, it was with great pride and a privilege to present to you, and I can't call him Ned Hollowell because I only know him as Ned. We all know him as Ned. Ned Hollowell. Friendship between 
between two inveterate wasps. <laughs> we talked about everything, from the thoughts that wander through eternity, to how to open little necks so they can be eaten straight from the shell, to how to make the perfect dry martini, to why Daisy cried when Gatsby tossed his shirts on the bed. We'd meet at the Harvard Club, we'd meet at the Exeter Inn, we'd meet in his living room, which now and then we'd have to evacuate when his black lab passed potent gas. <laughs> but wherever we'd be, Charlie always, always exuded a love of life, even when discussing despair. Although I was never his student in the classroom, I was his student forever in life. I will miss him so. But now he knows I was right about one of our longest standing debates. There is a God. There is a heaven. And Charlie is seated at the table of eternity, smiling his everlasting smile. It's part of life. The passing from this world to whatever is the next. And as we sit here now, maybe we could just take a moment and reflect on those we love who aren't with us right this minute. with no regard for authority, 
or where it's supposed to be. The ADD mind is the little toddler waddling off into the woods, into the lake, into the anthill. Uh, goodness knows where it ends up. At times, the ADD mind can hyperfocus, focus better than anyone, super focus. The building can be burning down, and the ADD person will stay there, riveted in attention. And then at other times, the mind disappears, goes off on its own. So attention deficit is, 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 is completely inaccurate. Not a, not a deficit, but an inconsistency. And, and uh, uh, that's just one of the many paradoxes. Really, if you, if you look at the, the core triad of symptoms, what my friend Russ Barkley calls the holy trinity of ADD, distractibility, impulsivity, and hyperactivity, each one of those only tells half the story. As I said, distractibility is coupled with super focus. Impulsivity. What is impulsivity but creativity going right? If you're, if, you're, if you're impulsive and you come up with a new idea, we say how creative. If you're impulsive and you overturn the table, we say how impulsive. And hyperactivity, what's that but energy? energy? I'm 64 years old, I'm very glad to have hyperactivity. So again, we, we have these, these various paradoxes. We have, we have, the, uh, we have the risk taker, or, or depending upon whether it's a it's a good risk or not, we have the risk, we have the person who's called reckless. You you go through the you go through the whole list of of uh, uh, traits that characterize ADD, and you find most of them exist in paradoxical pairs: impatient on the one hand, cut to the chase on the other hand. You know, you cut to the chase in a business meeting, you're called you're a good leader of a meeting. Cut to the chase in a romantic conversation, not so much. <laughs> okay, so you love me. What's your next point? <laughs> there, is, there is an inability to linger over any particular situation. Uh, and as you, as you get to know more about this, this way of being, this kind of mind, you find over and over again these paradoxical pairs. And, and the whole point is to learn how to take advantage of the positive side of it and limit the damage done by the negative side of it. It is so much more than a checklist of symptoms, and, and that's why these checklists drive me crazy. Uh, I know everyone uses them, I don't use them, but the, 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 the standard way of diagnosing now is people fill out a checklist, and, and I don't like that because it's, it's sort of like leaving the witness. I'd rather just have a description. What is Johnny like? Or what is Mr. Jones like? and then have a narrative description, much as if you were writing a novel about this person. What is so-and-so like? Well, I want to bring you more into this world of what these people are like by telling you a few stories, and then give you a little bit about the history of where it all came from. The first person I ever treated for ADD, way back in 1981, as I told you last night, I'd never heard of ADD until then. If I thought if someone said they had attention deficits, or I would have thought it was you hadn't gotten enough attention growing up. <laughs> well, I had learned about this condition, ADD, when I was a fellow in child psychiatry back in 1981. And uh, I was, I was uh, on uh, part of the experience of being a trainee in child psychiatry, was working on an inpatient unit. And this little boy, eight years old, was admitted to the hospital one day. And uh, I was at the Mass Mental Health Center. Uh, also, by the way, where I met my wife, Sue, I love to say to you last, where did you meet your wife? I said, I met her in the mental hospital. <laughs> and, uh, so the, this, this little boy got admitted. Now, Mass Mental was a fascinating institution. It was, on the one hand, a state hospital, which meant we got the, the impoverished mentally ill which are the, pretty much the most rejected group of society, the poor mentally ill. But it was also a Harvard teaching hospital. So it had a lot of very 
wonderfully smart, gifted, dedicated uh, uh, teachers. So here I was, learning about child psychiatry, and, and, and this little boy uh, gets admitted to the hospital. Um, I'll, I'll call him, what shall I call him? Frank, Frankie. So Frankie gets admitted to the hospital, eight years old. The day before admission, and this was typical of the kids that we would see, which is why the diagnostic manual to me is such a pale document, uh, because there's so much more in human nature than was ever dreamt of in the DSM-5. It's like the Shakespeare line, there's so much more in, in heaven and earth than was ever dreamt of in your philosophy. Well, there's so much more in human nature than was ever dreamt of in the DSM-5. So anyway, th this little boy was admitted having the day before witnessed uh, a murder and the day of admission having attempted to murder his mother by setting her mattress on fire and murder his, her sis his sister by pouring lye down her throat. And when I went in to meet him, he was in a seclusion room and he threw feces at me. So I left and came back the next day and he said to me, I spent the, I spent the night in your brain crawled out of your nose this morning. And so he was psychotic. And uh, uh, so we stabilized him, you know, put him on the unit and gave him a bath and, and had him, you know, uh, talk to people who weren't psychotic. And, and, uh, um, and his psychosis subsided. It was sort of environmentally created. No medication. Uh, and uh, he was able to have some psych testing done. And his IQ came out at 69, which is borderline retarded. Well, I began to, I began to talk to him, and uh, his roots were Southern Baptist, so we, we, be, we developed a game where we called it the Jesus game, where we'd ask each other questions, like he'd play Jesus, and I'd say, what do you do when someone disses your mom? And he'd have to come up with some answer other than kill him. You know, and, and, uh, and then I'd play Jesus, and he'd ask me the same question. So we'd, we'd come up with a, 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 a repertoire of possible responses. And as we began to play this game and get to know each other, uh, I said, you know, this boy really does meet the diagnostic criteria for ADD. It was then called ADD uh, before the, through the H. Although he did have the H. And, and uh, he also met the criteria for half a dozen other diagnoses. But, you know, I said, he, he does meet the criteria for ADD, so why don't I use this medication that I've never used before called Ritalin? First person I ever put on Ritalin, Frankie. And so we gave Frankie Ritalin, and sure enough, it had a very positive effect. He was able, he brightened up, he was, was more engaged, could wait his turn better, and all the things you see when stimulants work. And then I said, you know, he really seems a lot smarter than someone with an IQ of 69. He's able to abstract, he's got a sense of irony, he's got a sense of humor. Let's redo that psych testing. So we redid the psych testing. And his IQ came out at 140, which is genius level. I'll never forget that, and I've never seen that kind of change. Uh, but it always, uh, for that reason, I always look at psych testing, you know, with that in mind. It, you know, a lot of different forces uh, impinge uh, upon creating the score that you get when you get psych testing. From 69 to 140. Well, Frankie and I worked together for two years, and uh, he became a leader on the unit. I would meet with his mother. Uh, and, uh, from time to time. She did not like me. Uh, you know, she'd come in and say, what the hell can a white boy from Columbia do for my son? And, and, you know, I'd say, probably not much. And she had a little paper cup she used to spit in. She said she had uh, bronchitis, but it was really her way of spitting on me. And that was okay. Uh, Frankie was, was our object. And, over the two years, we got to like each other pretty much. And then I had to leave, because uh, my time was over. And, and uh, there was a rule on the inpatient unit that you couldn't touch, no PC installed, physical contact, because that was inappropriate. One of these 
really stupid rules to, to prevent child abuse and throw the baby out of the bathroom. But anyway, it was called inappropriate, don't touch. So I say goodbye to Frankie, and I say, Frankie, I have to leave. And, and uh, said, you know, we've really gotten to like each other. And he said, like each other? We love each other. And he said, I would kiss you on the mouth, but that would be inappropriate. <laughs> It was all about all the things that bring out the best. And that's why to this day I say I don't treat disabilities. I unwrap gifts. In those two years, we unwrapped Frankie's gifts. I don't know where he is now. But I'll bet you anything, wherever he is, it's a good place. Uh, many forces combined to help unwrap those gifts. Medication being just one. The most important force was the force of connection. And as I mentioned to you last night, we loved each other. And nothing makes a greater difference in life than that, the power of love. Another story. The first adult I ever treated, because as we said last night, of course we didn't know that adults had it. This was a fellow uh, uh, whose uh, IQ was tested. He wasn't an inpatient, but as an outpatient, we tested him. His IQ was 160. Now his problem is he couldn't hold a job, but he was able to get jobs because he was so smart. Uh, in one calendar year, he had collected 122 W-2 forms. Now, when you think about it, if you take into account weekends and holidays, that means he was pretty much getting hired and fired every other day. And what would happen is he'd get himself fired because he was so smart. And then he would quickly perceive how badly run the company was. And he'd tell his boss he was stupid. And he'd get fired. And uh, he just couldn't stop himself from saying, you're stupid. And so he'd keep getting fired. Well, when I met him, he'd held one job for a few months. It was the only job he could hold. It was a job as a night watchman. Didn't have to talk to anybody. And uh, as we, uh, as I explained to him what ADD was, and he began to understand these outbursts were really a function of impulsivity, uh, that maybe he could learn to inhibit that and maybe medication would help. Sure enough, within six months, he was the manager of the company where he had been the night watchman. An impressive story. Another story. Is Kyle Dotfill here? Is she here? Oh, great. I went to her session yesterday. I was so impressed with, uh, uh, with what she's doing. She and her associate, whose name I forget, uh, are going into the the prison system in, uh, was it Delaware, Maryland? Delaware. Delaware. Now the prisons are full of people with undiagnosed ADD, and we've known that forever. But our system is so retributive rather than restorative, people don't care. Well, Kyle uh, cares, and she's going in, and she's been uh, screening some of these inmates and uh, uh, coaching them on how to deal with their ADD. And I want to read to you because uh, one of the things she has these guys doing, they're all men, is journaling. And uh, uh, here is uh, uh, the account that one of them wrote coming out of her, her work with him. I did not realize that I had ADHD until a few weeks ago. As a child growing up, I assumed that I was normal and developed coping strategies to deal with my inability to focus on tasks and my lack of attention in general. My coping mechanisms were so effective that I was an honorable student who graduated in the top five of my high school class. The demands of college, coupled with living on my own, exposed flaws in my coping mechanisms. In no uncertain terms, college would become the first in a long line of failures. Even though I eventually graduated, it was a long, grown up battle with myself. As the complexity of adult life continued to unfold, my ADD started to exert more influence over my life. Life became not a series of accomplishments to celebrate, but one of stress and failure. I approached each challenge in my life from jobs, 
<clears throat> relationships, family, and even recreation, not as an opportunity to succeed, but as an opportunity to fail. By the way, do you notice how good this writing is? Uh, finally, after decades of this destructive cycle, my coping mechanisms failed completely. A broken marriage, questionable career decisions, and a home lost through foreclosure were just symptomatic of my life with ADD. Other psychological conditions, including suicidal thoughts and tendencies, just exacerbated my problems. At some point in my life, I finally made the decision to give up. Coming to prison became my new coping me mechanism. The structure and lack of choices allowed my earlier co coping mechanisms to become effective again. Once I was released from prison, real life quickly caught up with me and overwhelmed me. Not realizing there were legitimate problems that I could seek treatment for, I instead made choices that would return me to prison. This is where both my ADD and other psychological conditions were initially diagnosed. Although I am dealing with my ADD, I still have other conditions that, I cannot, that cannot be addressed until my incarceration is complete. This is because the Department of Correction does not currently have the appropriate treatment programs and probably never will. I view ADD as the tip of the iceberg. I'm aware that I'm learning new ways to deal with it. Being able to put a label on it has helped. It's that a portion of the iceberg that I cannot see that has worried me. As an afterthought, I reflect back on my first conviction in 2002. At that time, the court ordered that I be sentenced to the Portuxet Institute, a facility that specializes in psychological evaluation and treatment. The court orders were never followed. I sometimes wonder what my life today would be if that order had been followed. Since I've been a participant in the ADHD class, Kyle's class, and learning all about how deeply this disorder can affect those who are caught up in the justice system, as well as those who are living criminal lifestyles, I'm pretty certain that I have ADD too. With uh, a life of crime for the past 12 years, I often act out of impulse, and many of my crimes are either committed out of impulsivity or through pleasure seeking. So now I'm curious to know if I were diagnosed with ADD and treated for it earlier in my life, would things be different today? Could my poor decisions and negative behaviors have been prevented? I wonder now if I were to have had a life coach and be prescribed the proper medication, would I be sitting in jail right now? Would my life be different today? Could simple treatment for a disorder have made a difference in the outcome of my life? Since I can't change my past, what I can do is focus on my future. I have learned that people who have ADHD are more likely to return to jail than people who don't have it. I also know that there is treatment out there that will help reduce the effects caused by having ADD. So what I intend to do upon release is go seek medical attention to find out if I also have ADD and get put onto the proper medications. And treating the disorder is what will help keep me from acting impulsive and doing things that get me into trouble and placed in jail, then that's what I'm going to do. I mean, that man... That man is representative of millions, not only in prison, but in uh, uh, addiction programs. Most addicts that I've met are incredibly talented people, be it alcoholics, uh, drug addicts, sex addicts, gambling addicts, um, and, and a big chunk of them, I'm guessing at least 25%, have undiagnosed ADD because part of having this kind of mind is what I call the itch at the core of ADD. We people with ADD have a fundamental need to change how we feel internally. Ordinary life just doesn't do it for us. We have to juice it up somehow. There are adaptive ways of scratching the itch and maladaptive ways of scratching the itch. The maladaptive ways, drugs, addiction, danger, violence, incredible risk taking, and then adaptive ways. Physical exercise, a creative outlet. The reason I write so many books, it's not that I'm driven to write books. If I don't have a book going, I get depressed. Uh, intimate relationships, connection. Those are adaptive ways. You can't make the itch go away. You can find adaptive ways of scratching. We need to reach these people, these people who are languishing. One more story before I tell the sort of the history of the trait. My own story. I, I uh, come from an old New England wasp family, uh, characterized by what I call the wasp triad. Some of you have heard me tell this before. Uh, the wasp triad is alcoholism, mental illness, and politeness. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, uh, when my dad got home from World War II, he, he went crazy. 
and uh, he was put in a mental hospital. And uh, one weekend they said, okay, you can go home on a pass, see how you do. And when he got home, well, my mother was a very artful woman, and she talked him into making love instead. And that's where I came from. It's an interesting beginning for a psychiatrist. <laughs> And so he obviously went back to the mental hospital, and, and uh, uh, one thing led to another, they got divorced. And my mom married a very charming man who turned out to be an abusive alcoholic, and, and my mom, bless her soul, became an alcoholic with him. And I got sent away to boarding school at the age of 10. Um, so here you have someone who uh, had a psychotic father, an abusive alcoholic stepfather, an alcoholic mother, two so-called learning disabilities, I have ADD and dyslexia, and I'm sent away to boarding school at 10 years old. Folks with those demographics don't do well. <laughs> We've been studied. But by my age, 64, we're either dead or severely marginalized. That didn't happen. And the reason it didn't, it's not a miracle. I know exactly why that didn't happen. I know exactly why I'm here talking to you today. It's the power of connection, which I talked about last night. I always knew that my mother loved me, and my father loved me, despite the psychosis and alcoholism. I always knew that I was loved. And then, and then along the way, I've told some of you who heard me talk before, in first grade, in Chatham, Massachusetts, I'm six years old, I show up for school. I can't do the fundamental thing you're supposed to do in school, which is learn to read. We're sitting at round tables like this, only shorter, taking turns, see spot run, comes to be my turn. I can't do it. I stammer. I stutter. Well, back then in 1955 in Chatham, if you were a little boy who couldn't learn to read, they didn't have learning specialists. Your diagnosis was perfectly obvious. Stupid. You know, and your treatment plan was try harder. And they had uh, advanced <laughs> methods of getting you to try harder, like they might spank you or they, they might uh, put you in the corner. And if that didn't work, well, you were just very stupid. And, and uh, uh, that was the end of it. Well, I was lucky. I had this marvelous woman by the name of Mrs. Eldridge, who knew there was more to little boys and girls who couldn't read than being stupid. And there were better ways to help them than punish them or humiliate them. She had no formal training in reading that I know of, except she'd been teaching first grade for about 100 years. You know? <laughs> she was this very short lady with white curly hair, very, very plump. And uh, uh, during reading period, she'd simply come over and sit down next to me. And it was back when old ladies used to wear a lot of powder, remember that? So she'd sort of arrive like a sugar donut, you know, and, uh, <laughs> sprinkling these clumps, you know, uh, around us. And, and, uh, and she'd put her arm around me. So the, the, her forearm there and my little head here, and then this enormous cushion right here. <laughs> And she would hug me into that. And I would feel so safe. And as I would stammer and stutter, none of the other kids would laugh at me because I had the mafia sitting next to me. <laughs> and that was my treatment plan. That was my IEP. But it was brilliant. That arm took out of the equation the real disability. The real disability, as I've told you, I don't think of ADD and dyslexia as disabilities. I think of them as traits with positive and minuses attached. The real disabilities are shame and fear and believing that you're stupid. That's what holds people back. And that arm absolutely took those out of, out of the equation. I looked forward to reading period. And that's pretty amazing to take a six-year-old little boy and have him look forward to publicly humiliating himself every day. I looked forward to reading period. By the end of the year, I was still a terrible reader. I was the worst reader in the class, but I was the most enthusiastic <laughs> reader. My scores were rock bottom. I was a child left behind. But my desire to read was at the top. That arm has stayed around me ever since. I'm still a painfully slow reader. That's the price I pay for dyslexia. But I majored in English at Harvard College while doing pre-med, graduated high honors, and make my living now with words. Writing them, reading them, listening to them. Uh, that would never have happened 
and I had a different first grade teacher. Again, that's what I mean by the power of connection. One more connection. When I was at Exeter, I mentioned Charlie Terry, but I had a 12th grade English teacher, Fred Tremont. And in the, in, the, in the first week, we handed in a three-page story. And he handed it back to me, written at the bottom, interesting story, Ned. Why don't you turn this into a novel? And I thought, oh my goodness, I knew Exeter was a tough school. I didn't know I had to write a novel. <laughs> but I was flattered, because he didn't suggest anyone else that they write a novel. So I said, all right, I'll try. And I started. You ask someone how do you write a book, you do it one word at a time, you know. I started adding page after page after page. Sure enough, by the spring, it had become a novel. And it won the Senior English Prize and, and really, really gave me my start. But it, it was more than starting me as a writer. What that did was got me to prove to myself that I could do something that I would have thought was impossible. See, and that's the other part. It's one thing to create connection. This is Albert Zorn. The next thing is to challenge. In the context of connection, challenge. You want to challenge artfully, uh, but you want to challenge. That night, watch him. I told him he could, he could run the show, and he did. Fred Tremolo told me I could write a novel. I didn't think I could, but I did. And I can tell you for sure, every person with ADD that I've ever met can do more than they believe they can. Far from needing accommodations. I am not a big fan of accommodations. I think the only accommodation that really makes sense is untimed testing. And in my opinion, everyone should have untimed testing. Uh, there's a lot of people who get penalized by a time limit who don't have any. There's no pedagogical justification for a time limit. Unless you're preparing for a career on Jeopardy. <laughs> it really doesn't matter how fast you can come up with the answer. Um, but uh, but uh, uh, everyone I've met, in fact, wise people who don't have any, but particularly people with ADD, can do more than they think they can do. Most adults with ADD believe they've bought into some variation on the theme of I'm a loser. Some variation on the theme of I, I can't because I just don't have the discipline. I don't have what it takes. And that's the disability. That's the disability. That old line, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. It's true. Carol Dweck has proven that with her growth mindset research. Those of you who went, I uh, saw there was a presentation on that. Growth mindset versus fixed mindset. Fixed mindset says uh, what I can do is limited by my IQ, my age, my height, my gender, my income, you name it. It's my achievement level is fixed. Growth mindset says no matter what I want to do, I can put together the team and I can get there. And guess what? Whichever one you believe is true. It's tragic, people who buy into the fixed mindset. It is so liberating and inspiring, people who buy into the growth mindset. That's why I was taking Tom Brown to task a little bit last night when he talked about realistic hope. Realistic hope sounds so awful like to me like it's verging toward a fixed mindset. Get real, you can't do that. Get real, you can't write a novel, you're only in 12th grade. Get real, you can't go to medical school, you have ADD and dyslexia. Don't get real. Growth mindset. She's proven, and the beauty of it is, you can teach a growth mindset. Anyone can learn a growth mindset. Just as Marty Seligman has proven that optimism correlates with doing well. And you can teach optimism. Optimism, by the way, is not some airy-fairy Pollyanna, you know, everything's going to turn out fine. Optimism is a very muscular, bold attitude that says, bring it on, life. I can deal with it. It's sort of like a growth mindset. They're, they're cousins to each other. 
And the third member of this triumvirate is, is, the, is the attitude of grit. And Angela Duckworth has shown people who have grit, the ability to bounce back after disappointment, thrive. And grit also can be taught. It's attitudes, attitudes, that tell the tale of life, not fixed quantities. The reason I'm here today is because through the grace of God, I happen to believe in God. You don't have to believe in God. But by the way, if you want to know a simple definition of God is love, God is love. Everyone believes in love, so believe in God. But through the grace of God, I was brought to the right teachers, the right friends, the right places, the right institutions, where I was able to grow. And, and I'm still trying to grow. See, and that's the beauty of life. As long as you have hope, as long as you have the courage to connect, because there's a part of us that would always rather hold back. There's a part of us that would always rather not reach out. Because we can get hurt. But as long as you have the courage to connect, you can continue to grow. And you will. That terrible feeling of I can't, I'm not worthy, that's the disability. My friend David Nealman, David Nealman is one of the most wonderful men in the world. David Nealman grew up in a Mormon family in, 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 in Utah, a big family. They valued education highly. David did not do well in school. Uh, he struggled uh, in college. He got into Brigham Young, but he just couldn't do it. And he, and he dropped out, which was heresy in his family. How can you do this, David? You're giving up on what God wants you to do. That one family. And David said, I'm wasting my time here. He didn't know what ADD was, but believe me, he has it in a big time. And uh, so he dropped out. Well, long story short, he got into the uh, real estate business and the uh, aviation business, and next thing you know, he's founding a little outfit called JetBlue. And the day JetBlue went public, in a matter of hours, David made hundreds of millions of dollars. And he told me driving home that night, was I driving home to celebrate? He said, no, I felt like the same loser who couldn't have it in high school. Oh. And now he's left JetBlue, he's in Brazil, starting another fabulously successful airline. But he still feels fundamentally flawed. He still feels fundamentally defective. That is preventable. That's what we've got to stop. That's why this deficit-based model is so destructive. These kids internalize, these adults internalize. They think something is wrong with me because I don't fit this mold. Even though this mold is responsible for most of the bad things that have happened in life, they feel ashamed to be who they are. Here's David Nealman, one of the great benefactors of an incredible philanthropist, father of nine children, invented the electronic ticket, just came to it, typical ADD thing, just out of nowhere, came to it. And it is appropriate that someone with ADD thinks of a way for us to go to the airport and not have to remember to bring our ticket. <laughs> but who's feeling there's something fundamentally wrong with him when there's something so fundamentally right. Then the rest of my story is simply marrying the right person to find the right job. Yeah. You know, people with ADD have a funny way of marrying the wrong person. They <laughs> marry a caricature of a bad fifth grade school teacher. That's not a good idea. And then they work for a boss who is similarly <coughs> hard to uh, You want to marry the right person to find the right job. And, uh, uh, and then Truly, my most fundamental cherished goals in life have been fulfilled. I, my, my deepest dream was to have children and give them the happy childhood I didn't exactly have. 
and my youngest just turned 18, and they, they don't understand why I keep asking them, are you happy? <laughs> They're very happy, and uh, uh, it works out because of the power of connection. Well, let me tell you now a little bit about the history of where, how we got to where we are. This condition, you know, people say it's a new condition. There's nothing new about it. You can read descriptions of ADD in the, in the 1200s and the Middle Ages. You can, there have always been people who were particularly distractible, impulsive, and restless. It's just that the lens through which they were viewed was the lens of morality. You were considered bad because willpower was considered to be the causative factor. And the treatment was punishment. These are the battered children throughout history. And then in the 20th century, the medical model came along and said, no, it's, it's, it's not a moral failing, it's a, it's a medical difference. And in 1939, when Dr. Bradley used amphetamine to treat what we now call ADD and got spectacular results, then it was clear that this had a biological roots to it. And, and so it was called minimal brain dysfunction. You know, I qualify for that diagnosis. I wouldn't exactly want to go to a job interview and say, hi, I'm Ned Hallowell, I have minimal brain dysfunction. <laughs> but I do, you know, and, and, uh, and then it got renamed attention deficit disorder, and we realized girls have it, boys have it, you don't have to be hyperactive, you can be daydreamy, uh, women can have it, adults can have it. We, new medicines came in, and that's where we are today. Now, the problem with the medical model, problem with the it's a lot better than the moral model. It's a lot better than saying you're bad, you're lazy, uh, and we need to beat you. But the problem with the medical model is it's all about deficit. It's all about pathology. Attention, deficit disorder. Can you imagine how you, you feel when someone tells you you've got a deficit disorder, throw in hyperactivity? It's bad. All you hear is bad, 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 bad. Second grade, loser, can't, can't be a winner. And it's so wrong. So we need to replace that with a strength-based model. And this is my campaign for the rest of my life. We need to replace the, the exclusively deficit-based model with a model that says, look, this is a trait. It's not a disorder. It is composed of positive and negative attributes. If the negatives rule, yes, it can ruin your life. The prisons are full of them, the ad addicted population are full of them, the unemployed are full of them. Yes, it can ruin a marriage, it can ruin a family, it can ruin a life. Yes, it can be a horrible condition. But, if you take advantage of the upside, and these folks tend to be original, creative, dreamer, uh, trailblazer, pioneer, inventor, they're the people who colonized this country. If you think about it, who in the world would get on a boat in 1600 and come over here? You had to be a very special kind of person, and that's our gene pool. That's why I think of this as the American edge. It's the entrepreneurs. That's who this population is, and it's our great contribution to world civilization. You take advantage of that. I have in, in my practice self-made billionaires, not millionaires, billionaires. I have Academy Award winners, Pulitzer Prize winners, CEOs. I have people at the very highest level, you name the profession. That's the possibility. That's why we need to embrace a balanced model that says, if you manage it right, the sky's the limit. If you don't, disaster waits. And that's what makes it so interesting. It can go one extreme way or another. The analogy that I use is a very simple analogy, and it, but it really captures the heart of this condition. When I tell a kid that he's got this, I say, I have great news for you. You've got a Ferrari engine for a brain. You've got a race car for a brain. You are really lucky. You are blessed with an amazingly powerful brain. And I say, but there is a problem. You've got bicycle brakes. And that really sums up ADD. You know, Russ talks about the, this is a condition of disinhibition. You can't screen out incoming stimuli, hence you're distractible. You can't screen out outgoing impulses, hence you're impulsive and hyperactive. Well, that's a fancy way of saying race car brain with bicycle brakes. And that model is completely non-shaming. 
You can say to someone, your brakes failed you. Oh yeah, I've got to work on those brakes. I've got to work on those brakes. And I don't care what age you're at. That's what treatment, if you want to call it that, is all about. Unwrapping your gifts is all about learning to strengthen your brakes. So you can take advantage of the power of your mind. Another analogy I use, having ADD is like Niagara Falls. What you have to do is build a hydroelectric plant. Until you build the hydroelectric plant, it's just a lot of noise and mist. You build the hydroelectric plant, and you can light up, light up the state of New York. I'm in the business of building hydroelectric plants. I'm in the business of strengthening brakes. And that is a wonderfully rewarding thing to do. That is where we should be. We should be telling people, you strengthen your brakes, and you're a major league winner. Uh, and, and that's the truth. Now, how do you strengthen the brakes? Well, there's a, a number of ways. Uh, physical exercise may be the best of all. My friend John Rady wrote a wonderful book called Spark, the revolutionary new science of exercise in the brain. And if you exercise vigorously every day, I promise you, not only will your brakes get strengthened, will you be able to focus better and control your impulses, but you'll be less depressed, less anxious, or just generally feel better about life. Physical exercise, huge. Meditation. Lydia Zylowska out in, in, at UCLA did a pioneering study, turned it into a book, the, uh, the Adult ADD Cure Using Meditation, uh, showing that mindfulness training achieves result exactly on a par with meditation. And don't say, I have ADD, I can't meditate. Yes, you can. And Lydia took a, a, a whole cohort of young adults and got spectacular results. So exercise, Meditation, nutrition, whole foods, stick with whole foods, avoid sugar, avoid additives. I'm gluten-free. I, I went gluten-free because I needed to lose some weight before some hip surgery. I, I lost 25 pounds, and I'm, I'm still gluten-free, the pounds have not come back, and I feel better. I, I just think gluten-free is better for a lot of people with ADD. So consider trying gluten-free. It's not hard to just give up bread, basically, and cakes. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, uh, sleep. Get enough sleep. Now, most people with ADD don't need as much sleep as most people do. But uh, be careful that you don't uh, sleep deprive yourself. If you don't get enough sleep, you'll look like you have ADD whether you have it or not. <laughs> uh, and then the the, uh, the 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 force that I've been touting for so long: the power of connection. Take connection seriously. Take friendship seriously. Get close to people. Now you can't have too many. You can't have your life overrun with connection because they'll all become superficial. You just can't. <coughs> Doesn't mean you're being mean. You just you just cannot. Your brain can't process too many close connections. But make sure you have some that you really treasure. I've been playing squash with the same man for 30 years. I'm going to be playing squash with him on Tuesday. We quit work early, we go play squash, he beats me now because I have two hip, hip replacements. And then we go and have beer afterward. We love each other. I, I can kiss him on the mouth because he doesn't care if it's appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, we, we love each other. We get so much out of that time together. That's what I call the other vitamin C, vitamin connect. And people aren't getting nearly enough of it these days. It's the best tonic for your soul that you've got. So just take advantage of it. And it's not just human connection. Have a dog, our dog Ziggy, walking antidepressant. Uh, connection to nature, connection to music, connection to groups like this, connection to God, connection to ideas, connection to, you, know, you just go through the list. It's, it's, it, and the beauty of, of vitamin C is it's free. And it's infinite in supply. The sad part is a lot of people fear it. I'll be walking down the supermarket aisle, I love to food shop, and, and I play a little game. I try to make eye contact with people walking past me and see if I can get a smile out of them. Some people will do it, it's like we're part of a secret society. <laughs> but most people look the other way, it's like, what does he want from me? You know, you know, and, and you know, it's like, you know, it, it was so much mistrust out there. You know, so much, you know, it's, it's a shame. You know, you're not taking advantage of the, you know, we're all in this fucking life together. <laughs> we might as well help each other out. Particularly good at that because we will take the chance. We'll take the risk. 
you know, we'll break the ice. And, and uh, we really are natural, natural connectors. There are a couple of new, and I'm gonna, I know I have to stop in a few minutes, there are a couple of new things that I just want to alert you to. There is a marvelous game. It's a, it's a variant on neurofeedback, but the difference is this one really translates to the classroom. And I've been researching it now for two years. It's called attentive. Uh, it's misspelling of the word attentive. It's A-T-E-N-T-I-V, no E. And it should be released sometime in the next eight months or so. It's, it's a, and it'll be very affordable. It's a, something you, you put on a headband and you make figures move across the screen without touching the screen. The results we've been getting have been amazing. Not only do grades go up, but behavior completely, uh, behavioral control improves. Again, on a par with medication. Uh, we've had truly remarkable results. Uh, this company is, uh, I think this could be a, a real game changer. There's no doubt the future lies in non-medication treatments and brain training, and this is one. Another one that I commend to you is uh, filtered music. It's called Focus at Will. Go to focusatwill.com. Focus at Will. The guy who started it is a guy named Will Henshaw. And it's this amazing music. He was a rock musician. But he's engineered, scientifically engineered the music to take out the parts that are engaging. So what it does, I use it now when I'm writing. You listen to the music through headphones and it engages that part of your brain that would otherwise be distracting you. And it's marvelous. I'm able to focus much better on my writing while I'm listening to this filtered music. Focus at will. I've had kids who couldn't write papers suddenly being able to write papers. Focus at will, uh, dot com. And then the third one are, are is cerebellar stimulation, which uh, I got into years ago with Winford Dorr, and he went out of business, but the principle remains. Anything that challenges balance and coordination right. is good for ADD and dyslexia. Cerebellar. So standing on one leg with your eyes closed. Do it near your bed in case you fall over. Sitting on an exercise ball with your legs off the floor. Juggling, skateboarding, skiing. Anything that challenges balance and coordination stimulates the cerebellum, and that's good for, for ADD uh, as well as dyslexia. It's also good for core stabilization, by the way. Core exercises are, are really an important part. Well, I want to end by telling the story of my son building a birdcage. When Jack was uh, about 12 years old, he found a, a little bird in the backyard and, and uh, brought it inside and he said, this is Paris. And I said, how do you know, Jack? He said, well, that's his name. Like they had a conversation, you know. And, and so we got a little birdcage and, and, uh, at Walgreens and I thought Paris would die. Paris did not die. And Jack got uh, talking with the shop instructor at school, even though he wasn't taking the shop. And the shop instructor said, you know, imagine a birdcage. And uh, one day Jack says, Dad, you got to come to school today and pick up my birdcage. And I say, OK. And he says, and bring the suburban. <laughs> he built the biggest birdcage I'd ever seen. I could stand in this birdcage. It was bigger than, and, and, and what he'd done with that instructor, the instructor did what the adult could do, said, think big. It's like my teacher saying, write it off. And this instructor said, think big, and, and imagine, Jack, I could wish I could have seen his eyes. Really? Really? And then the difference between, if you say think big and it doesn't happen, you've got a cynic. If you say think big and it happens, you've got a life enthusiast. And this teacher brought out of Jack, this amazing birdcage bunches Fred Tramalo brought out of the novel, changed Jack's life forever. Jack is now a senior at Elon in North Carolina. He's already started a business in college, a talent agency. He's a born entrepreneur. He's a born enthusiast. And I'm telling you, it came from that birdcage. I'm telling you, it came from that birdcage. Build birdcages. <laughs> Start whatever it might happen to be. Get rid of the words, I can't, I'm not up to it, I'm no good, someone else will do it, I don't have the goods, and if you feel that way, follow my rule number one, which is never worry alone. Talk to somebody else who will encourage you. Because we all have these negative voices. We all have these negative voices. Don't listen to those. 
Don't let the negative voices rule your life. Fine, you have them. We all have them. But get with people who will cheerlead you, who will say you can build the birdcage, you can write the novel, you can start the business. You can grow Anna into the big thing it ought to be. You can... It's true. It's true. It's, it, it, this has been proven. Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. That's a fact. That's not a slogan. That's not some nicey, airy fairy thing that people put on, you know, billboards and, and uh, uh, to cover the grim truth that some people are just losers. People with ADD sell themselves way short particularly adults with ADD. You have so much power. The greatest power is found in partnership, is found in collaboration. Most of you need to partner up with someone who has attention surplus disorder. Uh, you, 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 need to, you need to marry or partner with someone who will sweat the details, who will count the beans, who will take your idea and methodically do what needs to be done to turn it into something. So you have the energy, you have the idea, you have the enthusiasm, you have the dream, then connect with somebody who can help you plan, who can help you, you know, measure twice and cut once, who can help you turn the, the dream into reality. You need structure. You need structure. Make friends with structure. Look at Shakespeare. Everything Shakespeare wrote was iambic pentameter. Da -da 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 -da. Very structured. But within that confining structure, he created infinite variety. You all have in your hearts and your brains the power to change your lives, to change other people's lives, to make your dreams come true. I'm here today to urge you, to encourage you, to dare you. Start it now. Leave here with the full intention of talking to the right people, putting together the right plan, changing your life, other people's lives for the better. I am living proof that this can be done. I should not be here today. I should be dead. The fact that I'm here with you today really is a testament to Charlie Terry, who I started off with, who is now in heaven, and the many other people like him who were kind enough to share love, hope, and enthusiasm with me, which I'm now trying to pass along to you. Thank you.